So when John Lynch says Brock Purdy is the leader in the clubhouse, Trey Lance is thinking what? As the only quarterback on the 49ers, healthy-ish, who also knows the playbook, because Brock Purdy's not healthy-ish, and Sam Darnold doesn't know the playbook, and that's the whole group. David Fails ain't walking through that door, <laughs> at least not yet, to be a camp arm. No, 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 he's not. Um, so what's right. Trey Lance thinking today? I, I think he's thinking what he already knew. I mean, he had a front row seat when Purdy balled out. He, you know, he was got a lot of credit for helping him out, remember? Uh, so I, I think he understands that it'd be one thing if they had signed, like if the Purdy situation, he was just out and it was like, yeah, we, you know, we're naming – some free agent guy we just signed the starter. That that's not what happened. He he has been around the guy that he essentially in a weird way, it wasn't directly because there was a buffer and his name was Jimmy Garoppolo, but he got Wally Pipped. Now he got Wally Pipped by the last pick in the draft. And I think as we sit here today, the story I guess still is writing itself. I mean the guy's gonna get opportunities, whether it never happens with the Niners, like he's gonna like he's not headed toward out of the league, but it's hard to say that, you know, based on the information we have, have a March 27th is one of the most disastrous trades in the history of the league. Because at the time, it was one of the bigger trades ever, right? A lot of times, it's just like that extra one, like you swap picks, which is weird. We always act like that's independent. No, you also get a one for the 12th pick. Then the following year's one, and then the third year's one. I mean, that was a lot. It, it just was. Multiple ones on top of your swap, which... Anyone that follows football knows that the trade value, those picks high are so valuable. So part of the reason you had to give up so much, like going from 12 to three, I bet if we looked at it, like going from 27 to 12 is less. Like it's just very hard to go up every spot in the top 10 because they're so valuable on the trade chart. It's a disaster guy. I mean, you traded all that for a guy that the team cannot say is our starting quarterback headed into year three, year three. He's now a backup. And where he falls in the backup hierarchy, I feel pretty confident saying this, I, I think is still wildly up for debate. And it's just because it's going to play itself out on the field. Yeah, what he has to be thinking is, I have to beat out Sam Darnold. That's what he has to be thinking. And if I were Brian Greasy, I'd be telling him, Trey, this franchise is riddled with backup quarterbacks that have become starters and starting quarterbacks that have become backups. So... That's what John Lynch said on March 27th while while Brock Purdy did, still had his arm in a in a machine, whatever, a sling-ish contraption. That doesn't mean you can't be the starter on opening day. Here is Brock – because to me, Brock Purdy is, is the, the example that Trey Lance needs to look at. Here is the last pick of the draft just became the starter. If he can become the starter, I can become the starter again. That's how he has to be thinking. And again, I, I don't think that scenario is that – we are not that far away from a scenario in which Trey Lance is the starting quarterback. Even if Brock is back and healthy in the week one starter, Brock Purdy has been hurt now. Just like yeah. Trey's been hurt. Just like Jimmy was hurt. So, if – you know, now to your point, if Trey Lance becomes the starting quarterback of the 49ers, if five years from now he's the quarterback of the 49ers, we have it, – it is a comeback story. Right. Well, I mean, he he was currently announced at the owners meeting going into his third year. I mean, he's the backup. He's a backup quarterback. Like the, that's what John Lynch said. Obviously, there are variables still to play itself out. But as of right now, Trey Lance is viewed internally by the team. These are no longer just opinions as a backup quarterback, as a backup quarterback. That, that's it's no longer in our opinions or other people's opinions. That These are facts. So, and, but this is the way the league plays out. And even John, which I think makes him very unique to be able to talk about this. This guy's a former player, a hall of fame player, a guy whose career he's talked about it started really slowly. So it's like, this is the NFL. You know I mean? This is the, it's always why I think position players, which is basically everything beside kickers and quarterbacks kind of get offended. Like when certain positions and it's mainly kickers and quarterbacks, like, get very sensitive at stuff. They're like, we deal with this constantly, right? Y you get in a game, you're playing shitty, you get removed, the backup comes in, but you're technically can start the next week and you're constantly rotating at certain positions. 
So it's like, this is pretty normal NFL protocol for literally every other position. Unique to quarterback, but I'd say not unique to quarterback when you, when in a situation like this where winning is just, they're not developing the roster. They're not hoping to, you know, go from four wins to eight. This is a team that's at the point now where it's like anything less than a Super Bowl appearance, you know, is a disappointment. Because last year was devastating. Like, they were in the NFC Championship. Think how many teams in the NFL would die to be that devastated. And now they've back-to-back games where two years ago they had a lead in the fourth quarter. Last year it ended fast because of Purdy's injury. But holy shit, I mean, they went into that game, you know, clearly the way the players talked after. Like, fucking, we had a game. We are going to win the game. Yeah. I think getting there has to give you an appreciation of how hard it is. Like, I was thinking about Gonzaga today. Maybe they'll never win a championship. I mean, they beat UCLA in another great game. And before Monday morning, they're out of the tournament. It was just over. It just ended that fast. After they they had to feel like they were a team of destiny after they beat UCLA the way they beat them. And then they, with 17 minutes left in the game, with some people having them at 15-1 to one to win the national championship, some of those people, one of those people, Said, I uh, turn off the TV, change the channel. This game's over. And um, that person's on the show now. Uh, so I, I do wonder if you're Mark Few, are you like, next year's our year? Or is it just a reminder of how lucky you have to be? And I think it's a reminder of how lucky you have to be. Like, you know, if you're in the you final know, you like, beat Memphis in the first round by like a buzzer beater? I didn't know it was by a buzzer beater. No, I don't. Didn't see any of that game. Didn't watch it. But so, someone brought up the point. I was listening to a podcast today. Like, you know, the NCAA tournament, it's always funny when a team gets to the final four. And it's like, you forget about the round of 32 where they were down two with like 10 seconds left and they got some call that went their way. Then they hit the fadeaway three. But then if you win the next couple of games, it's just about the final result. Where ultimately, like you've always said, like Trey can easily, based on injuries, based on get his chance. But we've seen enough chances, or I mean times in NFL history, that it just might not, like you might actually not, right? There, there might be a year where a guy doesn't get injured and you actually don't get to play. Because that happens a lot in the NFL. Most teams that are successful, which has made the 49ers very unique, don't constantly have a rotating door quarterback. I would say the Niners truly have been the outlier when you look at the other teams the last couple years, right? The Rams, they've had two starting quarterbacks. Goff forever, and then boom, they trade for Stafford. Boom. Right? Last year, Jalen Hurts has been the last year, couple years, full-time starter. He got injured, but he immediately comes back. Right? And honestly, they, they probably held him out for an extra game or two. Burrow, Mahomes, like this. The Niners are an outlier situation right now in the NFL. A team that a lot of people pick the, every single year to win the Super Bowl that do not have a top-10 quarterback, which you could argue is a positive for Trey, but also can be a negative for him. You know, it kind of works both ways. It should open back up, but eventually sometimes it doesn't, you know? I don't think I don't think Alex Smith, again, these the situations aren't apples to apples, but like his career was taken off like a fucking rocket, gets a concussion, never starts again for the 49ers. Yeah, I mean, but he started he started for the Chiefs and it was a comeback story, right? And that's like sometimes your comeback happens on another team, sometimes it happens on the team you're on. For Trey right now, it's a comeback story. Come back from injury and come back from being pushed down the depth chart. I would say it kind of defines his quarterback class a little bit, right? I mean, him and Zach Wilson, different. You know, I mean, Trey is not not liked. It feels like Zach, <clears throat> one, is not good. Like, we have way more evidence on Zach not being good than Trey, but clearly the team doesn't like him. <laughs> the coaches don't trust him. They immediately made him the third. Uh, the, his wide receivers clearly do not think he can play. But both those guys' careers for going two and three in the draft, which you just look historically, like most guys do not turn out to be fucking Mahomes and Peyton Manning. It's not usually the way it works. You know? I mean, for every Joe Burrow going number one, there are a lot of quarterbacks that go high. And it just gets weird and it gets weird fast. And part of the reason it gets weird fast is because we talk about these individuals so much. Like, if Kinlaw was a quarterback, it would be discussed like Trey Lance. But ultimately, he's a defensive tackle, and no one gives a fuck. Well, he got John Lynch got asked. He's like, I've given up on Javon Kinlaw. No no way. 
I'm looking forward to him being part of the defensive line rotation, which is not what you're looking for when you take a defensive lineman in the teens of the first round. No. Rotational defensive lineman. But but isn't isn't that kind of what I was saying though about why these other positions like you just kind of get shoved down, shoved down, and then it's just like you play a little, but no one even notices you. Where the quarterback, it's pretty clear where they're there's no rotating. I can't do the Burford Brunskill move, right? Right. I mean, you kind of can with an athletic quarterback. But Trey has proved that actually his athleticism doesn't translate like they clearly thought it would, which is literally been on record by the 49ers, right? I forget who report was Albert Breer wrote that. that you know, the 49ers are a little disappointed. They thought it would be a little quicker. Yeah. Uh, it was Breer, and it was, I don't know, three weeks ago. Thought it would be a better runner. Um, and I think the question mark but, that we might not know until he's gone is, is he actually his speed doesn't translate? Does it turn out he's just not as fast? Or could he never get confident, you know, to get past like running at 85, 90%? It's, it's you know, we, you'd make an educated guess right now, but I, I think it's hard. You'd probably lean, maybe you watch that North Dakota State, the speed you know, the speed, how fast he looked on tape, the, the, it's not really comparable. Like, if I watch a guy running around for Alabama or A&M or LSU or Ole Miss throughout an SEC schedule, it's pretty clear, like, this guy can move, right? Like, when when I watch Caleb Williams week in, week out playing Utah, Oregon, like, it's like, okay, I can see it is pretty difficult at lower levels, even Power 5. Like, who's the first – if you if you watch a guy from, like, Fresno State, or Cincinnati, Cincinnati in the Big 12 now, but whenever they were in the smaller conference, the first games you pick is when they're playing their non-conference, which is typically against Power 5 teams. Like you would watch, if you were watching Fresno State, like, oh, they played UCLA and Oregon, right? You'd watch those first two games, you know, potentially first because they might have three or four guys that are draft eligible on defense. You can kind of see, see some speed. And I think sometimes it's more difficult to do at the – you know, D1 AA level, even at a program which, you know, the irony is like the North North Dakota State program could translate, like you could put them in the Mountain West and they would probably be able to win seven games, you know, eight yeah. games. But that's just not the, it's just not the reality for the schedule that they play. I, I am, um, I don't know if optimistic would be the word. It's not about optimism. I think there's a chance that if we saw Trey Lance play 10 to 17 games that what you'd get eventually is a guy who is a capable um who is a threat as a runner not dangerous not lamar not that type of runner but who can make play like what did they want they didn't want necessarily a quarterback who would do a bunch of reads and run nine times a game they just wanted a guy who can make plays when a play broke down that's like that is really the athleticism we're talking about, right? Yeah. You can go break off a nine yard run. You can get out of the pocket and make a throw on the run. I do think even though Trey and I've been, I feel like I've been banging the drum first that he's not a comfortable runner. I think he is athletic enough to be the guy that they want as like the, what the prototypical quarterback, modern quarterback is from an athleticism standpoint, even though he's not, you know, Josh Allen, nobody really is. I do think he has that level of baseline athleticism. You have to be a good thrower then for the guy you're looking yes, at, right? Yes, different. I'm just saying I do, I do think he has the baseline of athleticism to be that guy. Don't disagree there. So, you know, the question then is, can he get himself in enough games? And that's, that's you know, we go back to last year, right? That's the difference now. That's one thing that's very clear. The difference between 2022 and 2023 is in 2022, he didn't have to get himself in games. They were going to put him in all the games. Yeah. And in 2023, he's got to get himself into the games. He's got to force his way into the games. They're not putting him in the games anymore, which is kind of – you talk to NFL players about the draft. They're always like, the difference between being a second-rounder and a fifth-rounder is just how much leash you get, right? You got you saw it all the time, I'm sure. A guy that you liked in the fifth round didn't get the leash that the GM liked in the second round. Well, he got the leash, and that leash got cut in half now. And it, you'd say he's going to get treated like a normal player now. Because once you get farther and farther removed, whether I give you a big contract, right, or I make a big draft day trade from you, a year, two years out, I'm still 
emphasizing the return on my investment. I think once you get to year three on basically majority of these deals, again, contract or draft day trade, I think those it's just kind of irrelevant because your team yeah. is so different, right? So, you you know, the, the equity in the locker room is just about producing and that we're far enough away removed that you guys just got to earn it and given their situation of trying to win games at the highest level. Yeah. Which is what John Lynch made was clear. Like, this is why we got... Javon Hargrave is because right now is our window. Exactly.